Venerable religious and dear parishioners, we read in today's epistle St. Paul's exhortation with all humility and meekness, with patience, here, bearing with one another in love, careful to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I was, as I was reading that line from St. Paul, it reminded me of his exhortation to what you could say is Christian family living. It does seem like a very direct exhortation for families. And these are the things that make family life uh, go well. Humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, careful to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. One phrase I would like you to really keep in mind, or a couple of phrases, that get across this idea that your family life, your home life needs to be sanctified. One of these phrases is domestic church. This is what a Catholic home should be, a domestic church. Another way to put it, and I would refer to this book that we use for preparing couples for holy matrimony towards happiness and holiness and marriage. It's a reprint. The book was originally published in 1955, but it's really excellent. And one of the chapters here in the book, chapter 11, says, your, church, your home, a church in miniature. So, two phrases that are very powerful, very inspiring. Either domestic church or your, your home is a church in miniature. Now, I have I brought along a couple of references in this regard. We see the idea of a home being referred to as a church in St. Paul's letter to the Romans. And he says, this is in, towards the very end of Romans, it's kind of like a way to wrap up his letter. Of course, this is the revealed word of God. And St. Paul goes into many doctrines and practices in his book to the Romans. But he, he towards the end, in chapter 16, he says, Greet Prisca and Aquila. Greet also the church at their house the church at their house. And the commentary from the Haydock Bible um, uh, says that either there was a church there and, you know, some maybe these were better well-to-do people and they were able to have a large room of their house set aside for worship. And when one of the apostles or, or bishops or priests came to say Mass, people would gather there. This was not a time when, when Christians could freely build churches throughout Rome. Remember, the persecutions were about to begin very, very fiercely. The first major one under Emperor Nero, he would be the one who would put St. Paul to death, by the way. So, so it was either that or another possible interpretation is that the house is considered a church. Again, the idea of a domestic church, a church in miniature. So I'm going to kind of go with the second idea there of the, the people living a fervent Catholic or Christian, same thing, Christian life, and there are elements they are in the home that are a reminder of things in church. Now, obviously, we don't do the same things in church as we do at home. We would never dream of eating inside the church or having conversation as we do in our home. So obviously, this is just an analogy. But there comes across that idea that home life should be sanctified 
There should be a fervor of living. Not, you know, Christianity isn't just something to do on your own. It's something to be done together. And what is that society that we first enter? The family. Before one can become a productive member of the larger society, of civil society, one enters the society of the family and it needs to be striving for holiness. So I'd just like to quote a few things here from this chapter 11 on your home, a church in miniature. Catholic couples looking towards marriage must also look beyond. They must look to the building of a truly Christian home, and they must prepare themselves for it. To this end, they should bring themselves to realize that as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers, they will be members of the lay priesthood, so to speak, and that as such they will have duties they did not have before. They should look forward to building their homes into little churches. They should be keenly aware of the meaning of the words of the psalmist, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So this book puts across, gets across so well the idea that the family is a divine institution. The family is directly established by God himself through the institution of marriage, which our Lord, of course, raised to the dignity of a sacrament, the sacrament of matrimony. This is not a, just a nice option to have to be raised at home by father and mother. This is a great necessity. This is God's plan, nothing less than God's plan. And children need to be uh, looked upon as a truly a blessing. Yes, there are a lot of work to raise, but they are a great blessing. They need to be loved and nurtured and taught how to become holy in the home. That is the first school of virtue. Even though the physical building of the church is God's house, nevertheless, it begins in the home. The teaching of virtue. It's interesting that this book goes on, and I, I won't have time to quote everything, but it talk, talk, uses the phrase, the priesthood of the parents. Obviously not the priesthood of the, of the sacrament, but in a sense that they are the leaders, the spiritual guides and leaders, in a particular way the father, because he's head, the head of the family. But spiritual guidance and leadership. Having a church, the home as a domestic church means, of course, there has to be prayer. And on this first Sunday of October, the month of the Holy Rosary, I have to exhort you, pray the rosary together as a family. I've seen this over and over and over again throughout my years as a priest. The families that pray the rosary, they have many good things happening, blessings happening to them. The families that neglect it, by and large, they have more problems the domestic church must have prayer. And besides the, the daily rosary together, morning and evening prayers, what are one? You have to open the day with prayer, and you have to close the day with prayer. And each family has its own beautiful customs or should have its own beautiful way, you know, prayers that they pray in the morning and prayers they pray in the evening. Again, this is how to make a domestic church. Um, having sacramentals in the home, a Catholic home is known for having crucifixes and holy pictures in the home. And again, using, using our analogy of the domestic church, what would you think of if there were no statues and pictures of course, you would say the Novus Ordo would have hit the church. <laughs> Obviously, we'll never let that happen. 
They really are against holy pictures and holy statues. But obviously, they are so conducive to devotion, they uplift us. As soon as we put our eyes on a statue of a saint or our Lord, our Blessed Mother, it immediately uplifts us. This is the purpose that it should serve in the home. Even though it's not the house of God, per se, nevertheless, the domestic church should have those. Um, even every room, every room of the house, or at least the rooms that are used regularly, have those blessed articles of devotion. Holy water, having holy water fonts in the home. At least one or two uh, may be coming into the door, you know. Bless yourself. We do that when we come inside the church. Certainly nothing wrong and only helpful to have at least uh, one or two places in the home where that can be done. Uh, the blessing of the house. This is something that, that the parents can do. And you can especially invite the priest, the spiritual father, over to your home to give it a blessing. There are officially approved blessings in the Roman ritual uh, for the home. I'm thinking of at least three different ones. There's one particular for Easter time. Again, why not do this? It should be evident when a, anybody comes into your home that it's a Catholic home. You know, one of the things that was so inspiring to read about the Russian people, even though they've been mired for centuries in the schism and heresy of the, of the Russian Orthodox Church, nevertheless, they have a great devotion to Our Lady. And Pope Pius XII alluded to this in his consecration of the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, where he makes mention of Russia, and he says, may, through this devotion that they have to thee, may it lead them to the true faith. But the Russian people would always make it a point that whenever somebody came in their home, one of the very first things they would see would be an icon of Our Lady, an icon of Our Lord. And when the persecution came under atheistic communism, they would sometimes wall it up or put, you know, plaster in front of it or something to hide it but they would still honor it and reverence it. If the, secret poli if the police came and, of course, saw the, the, the icon on display, they'd be arrested and God knows what else would happen. So they would hide it, but they would still know where it was and they would reverence it. Celebrating religious family milestones, marriage anniversaries, baptismal anniversaries. Oh, one other thing. Parental blessing. This is something my, I remember my father doing in particular when I was growing up. Before, after we said our little night prayers together, he'd give us a blessing. Each one of us children. Um, also, I remember he gave us a good night kiss. I always remembered how sharp or not sharp his razor was because he really put his face right up there. So... Uh, but I, I look back on that, I realized, you know, that, that, that bond that he was promoting there. Again, the idea of the domestic church. Um, one book I want to recommend, and I hope it will be available soon in our bookstore. If it's not already, it's called Around the Year with the Trapp Family. And this was written by Maria von Trapp in the 1950s, and it is a marvelous book because it talks about all the different ways to sanctify family life according to the liturgical season of the church. It's really beautiful. Um, just traditional Catholicism lived in the home. There are also great dangers to the domestic church. You know this as well as I do electronics. They've been around a long time, television, radio, now we have internet, the pervasive internet, and so much horrible harm 
can come through them because again, we what's on there, you know. When mother was telling me how uh, saddened she was when her husband allowed her young daughter to get a cell phone and she was opposed to it and it caused horrible harm in her daughter's life because of what came through it. I mean, what sense does it does it make to have to, to strive for the domestic church at the home and then have it undermined, destroyed by what's coming across electronically? And even if it was completely safe, again, the distraction, the, the addiction, video games, children sitting hour after hour after hour after hour playing video games, is that, is, is that something that goes well with the domestic church? Recreation is a good thing, but kept in perspective. And parents, you, ha you can't be careful enough to know what your children are being exposed to through electronics. Video games, there are some horrifying g video games. I mean, very immodest, worldly, gory, blood spattering, murdering going on throughout the whole game. Is this something that is you want your children exposed to. It's very harmful to them. So again, it's going to be a real challenge, but it is well worth it. Control these things. Don't let them ruin your children's spiritual lives. Uh, so much more can be said on it, but I'll leave it at that. Learn more and more about the Holy Rosary. It's great power. We're in the month of the Holy Rosary, and it will do marvels for you, for you personally, for your children, for the domestic church, and for the church at large, and for all of society. As St. Dominic said in the Middle Ages, one day through the Rosary and the Scapular, the world will be saved. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Son.